up through the Region 6 uh, schools, uh, so as well. My father didn't quite do that. He graduated 12th grade across the street at James Morris School. Um, we have an excellent relationship with Chris Leone, the superintendent of Region 6, and also now superintendent at Litchfield Schools. He's very accessible. He's very transparent. We have not seen that in a number of years with the superintendent at Lomogo. We also have a very good board of education here in Region 6. They work well together. They're making great decisions. They're investing into our schools. I think we're moving in the right direction. Chris Leone is the person to help bring our two school districts together. He, uh, he has the enthusiasm. He has the time. He puts it all into that. I think we support our superintendent. We're moving in the right direction. You got to start slowly. You don't want to jump in because, again, this has been going on since I think about 1954. So let's work together. Let's progress. It's going to be better for our children in the long run and better for us as a community. Um, I definitely share um, Tom's admiration for the job Chris has done. Um, uh, that, that can't be understated. Um, we also need to be careful, too, because um, the ebbs and flows of this, there's been times where um, uh, we were at the, the negotiation table and wanted to join, and, and then there was times where Litchfield doesn't. And um, there seems to be an interest now in Litchfield, and we're still within that window, of their interest in joining school districts. And uh, we need to take advantage of that uh, while we have the opportunity before that door closes on us for another period of time. We can't sustain for $24,000 per student uh, yearly. And yes, I, uh, Chris Leone, I've been fortunate enough to meet with him quite often, as I said, as a first selectman with the other first selectman of Warren and Goshen, and also Litchfield now at our last meeting. We talked about the future of the two systems, and uh, we'll work in that direction, and we're off to a great start right now. Uh, the other part of that question was what services in terms of personnel and so forth that you would share between Morris, Goshen, and uh, Warren. As you, as you seem to be sharing our educational needs in Region 6 as a unit, can we share government services through the three towns to work together? And do you see any that you can or you don't think it can be done? Yeah. yeah, do you have a few on 30 seconds? No, let's start, let's start another two minutes. Another two minutes. No, sure, sounds good. Um, so I've lived in a few different areas in the country. Um, uh, I've lived for a couple of years out in California, and they, they run a county system. Um, many places across our country have uh, robust county governments in which um, first responder services, public works, social services get run out of a county government system. Um, it's very difficult here in Connecticut because of 189, 160, 160. 160. I'll get you to that in 20. Um, they, everybody reinvents the wheel for themselves. Um, I would be uh, very excited. I, I think it, you know, uh, it's a first step in the educational department to start sharing resources. Um, I do think that the two could eventually be hand in hand um, if the redistricting of the schools included. Um, uh, Litchfield and, and Morris and Warren and Goshen. I do think that there's then opportunities for the mis municipalities to look into how share uh, public works can be shared as well. Um, I do believe that there's a potential for other positions within, uh, say, a tax collector office. There's no reason why eventually a tax collector can't work independently um, on the source for of, of the, the four towns. So, uh, I gotta say. You know, we don't limit our sharing just to the other two towns in our district currently. We are part of the Northwest Connecticut Council of Governments. Those, that's 21 towns in Northwest Connecticut. And we work uh, cooperatively, cooperatively sharing services already, uh, whether it be IT. Uh, you could also get engineering costs reduced and work with an engineer that has been hired by the Council of Governments. Currently, we do share public works uh, equipment and personnel with our area towns, including Litchfield. We continue to do that. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity. They have a grader that we don't have. They come and grade our roads. They need a person over there. We send a person over there. It's been really good. Um, but we also share beach and recreation activities with the uh, town of uh, Warren and Goshen. We're sharing the uh, activities plus sporting activities with our beach and rec department. Also, our senior trips are very active with Warren and Morris. 
with that and with the Council of Governments, there's really no limit of what we can do as far as reducing the cost, working together as a region, working together for, against some legislation from Hartford that may negatively impact our towns. And that's what we do right now, and we'll continue to do that. Yeah, um, all, of those, uh, all those areas of sharing are, are very helpful. Um, a number of them, though, are the lesser costs. Um, whether you, you look through a municipal budget or an education budget, I think we all know that the largest portion tends to be employees. Um, so I think as far as a long-term goal that we'd be speaking of, um, I do believe in, if we're looking at cost-effective and productivity, uh, employee sharing would definitely be something to work towards. Yeah, you get one more. Yeah, and as far as sharing, uh with our school district too and the other two towns, we're looking to talk with Region 6 this winter, Ann Warren and Goshen, possibly Washington uh, and Litchfield about working together to lower our health insurance costs. The larger pool you have, that'll help lower the cost for the, uh, for the towns and hopefully better benefits for the employees. If in fact you actually got a budget surplus, how would you use it? Budget surplus, we, we get a budget surplus every year. Uh, the past couple years, we've worked with a tighter budget. We haven't used our fund balance, which is our, the balance of money we keep on hand. So our budgets have gotten very tight, the, and uh, they should go back into hopefully lowering the mill rate, and also should go back into the fund balance. We need to maintain a good, healthy fund balance so we can pay our bills uh, on you know, a weekly basis. When the bill comes due from Region 6 for close to a million dollars, you need to have that money in the bank waiting for it. I return it to the people, or we would put it into a capital, not a reoccurring project. Um, one of the issues I've had with surpluses, and, and many residents have, is they've seen their tax rate grow. They've seen the budget grow, and when all of a sudden they read about a surplus, they're wondering, well, why did you tax me in the first place for the money you ended up having? And, and then second, though, why can't you send, give this money back to me? Um, that money can belong better in someone's bank account. If we want to encourage people to remain in our town, we want to encourage people to invest in our town, we have to make smarter decisions. So there's a balanced effect to that. Um, you know, uh, if we have a lower mill rate and we have a surplus, it probably doesn't go back to the um, to the people. It goes into uh, a capital project or it goes into um, our savings account. Well, the surpluses that we've had in the past couple of years have been fairly small because we do have a tight budget. When you have a tight budget, that means you're not overtaxing the people in your town. You're taxing it correctly. So when you work with the Board of Finance, and you work with all of your uh, department heads and commissions, and create a good, solid budget, it'll be very tight. Anything that comes back definitely should be reinvested into the town. You can't write refund checks to every person in this town when you have a surplus. You just can't do that. That's not the way government works. That's not the way municipal finance works. Reinvest into the town, or hopefully, hopefully lower your mill rate a little bit. That's what we've done three out of the last four years. Our mill rate has gone down. Yeah, um, we the last four years we've averaged a mill rate of 27.4. The previous four years we averaged a mill rate of 23.9. So um, while our mill rate came down slightly, uh, the majority of that mill rate reduction was because our educational share of Region 6 reduced. And once again, not all of that money that our share of Region 6 reductions went back to our lowering our mill rate. Some of that money was used to increase our uh, municipal budget. Well, since 2014, our Region 6 budget has actually grown by $17,000. And the aid from the state has actually gone down $554,000. So you have to make up that money someplace else. When the state aid disappears, it's going to cost you a little more in your mill rate. So when you're saying how this uh, school assessment has gone down or up, it's gone up $17,000 since 2014. Thank you. Yeah, Mike. Um, most of the towns in the Northwest are experiencing an aging population and an inability to attract young people. What concrete steps would you take, such as 
maybe reducing lot sizes for a building or anything else you can think of that might bring back more young people and make them stay here? Well, I think we're at a, a good point to start making discussions on what we want to do for the next 10 years. The Planning and Zoning Commission is currently working on their plan of uh, conservation and development. This is a plan that kind of lays out where they want to see the town go in the next 10 years. Mr. Curley's on that commission. I believe people need to pay attention at this point. Where do you want your town to be? I love the, the rural atmosphere we have in this town. I can do without some of the services just so I can live here with a little bit of el elbow room. But in, to, in order to attract younger people, perhaps we need like a fiber optic service throughout the town where they could actually work from home. They don't have to travel to Hartford to work. They can work, do their business right here in Morris. And I think that's what we need to aim for. So I am on planning and zoning, and uh, we are currently working on POCAD, um, mm -hmm. the Planning of Conservation Development. Um, I have been a champion for responsible development since I've been on planning and zoning. I do believe that there is areas of town that we could reduce lot size as an opportunity um, to encourage families who might want a smaller lot. There are a lot of people who, maybe unlike most of us, like a bigger lot. Um, and um, But there's a number of other areas. Um, first, I think to encourage investment, encourage a family uh, to purchase a home, to build a home, we have to make it financially feasible. Where our taxes have gone per month is not at a place that's encouraging families at the moment. Um, the second aspect to this is I'd like to create a tax incentive plan um, for home and for business building. Um, there would be a lot of negotiation, but I'd like to create a three-year plan where it wouldn't be till the fourth year to a uh, new build owner pays complete on their taxes at the you know at the onset. Uh, they're paying on the land, and eventually, four years, if we can encourage them to buy a lot and build a building, to start a business, to buy, to purchase a job, to build a home, after a number of years, we would be receiving a full investment in that tax, um, from taxes on that property. Well, I don't think you really should just target young families and uh, encourage small lot sizes. I, I don't think people live here to live next door to each other in a quarter acre lot. Some of us do, depending on what district you're in right now, but most of us don't. We like our room, we like the character we have here in Morris, and we want to continue that. Yes, we need young families, but don't just cater towards young families, because as we know, as Mr. Curley mentioned, it costs about $24,000 a year to educate a child here in Region 6. What are you going to get off a quarter acre lot with a house on it? You might get four or 5000 maybe. So a family of four moves in, we have two children, that's $50,000 more a year in uh, our assessment to Region 6. It's going to be a long payoff. I encourage everyone to move to Morris. Enjoy what we have. Be a volunteer, whether you have children, whether you're old. Um, so there's about 154 children in James Morris, um, my, my children included. Uh, Ten years ago, there were 252. Um, I have to imagine that when there were 252, our uh, cost was not $24,000 per pupil or, or higher. So um, it's not a linear line. Um, our classrooms are empty and they can grow a little bigger. 50 extra students is not going to demand a substantial increase in um, educators, which is the primary cost of Region 6. Well, 50 extra students can definitely increase our assessment to Region 6. And if you're trying to lower our mill rate, you're going in the wrong direction. Um, sure. Uh, we can't close our town to young people, to young families and children. That's, that, that's the fiber of, of our community. So um, I do think that, um, and to be clear, we are also considering redistricting options. So there's a number of moving parts in this, but at the end of the day, uh, we have a declining enrollment and uh, it needs to be fixed. Okay. A simple question. What are your plans for the Munson House? I said it right? Yes. Next door. Plans for the Munson House as we uh, 
talked about when we had the town meeting to purchase that house. Uh, there's a number of options. Right now, we, are, we have a first responder service in Morris. Uh, the people actually stay in their homes. When a call goes off, they leave their homes with a bag for EMS service, and they respond directly to the location where the person may be hurt or ill. Perhaps that would be a good place to put up a first responder building, uh, a place to house the vehicle for them, a place for them to be able to sleep at night as when they're on call. That's one of the options. Another one would be more parking. When we have events over here at James Moore School and an event here at the Town Hall, there's very little safe parking to be had in this area. You could turn the lot, that lot, at least temporarily, into a parking area until you decide to build a pot. Again, I mentioned in the past, the septic service for this building isn't around here. It's way over next to the solar field behind James Morris School. We may not have access to that area in the future. We need to plan for the future. Perhaps that area could be used for our septic system for the town hall, uh, additional well, because the well service isn't the best in this area. So those are just some ideas that we have for that property. Yeah, so um, my understanding from the property is a well would be very difficult because of ledge. Um, uh, I would advocate immediately for the demolishing of the building. Um, because at this point, uh, it shouldn't cost us anything. Um, we've already made the purchase on it. So um, there's a few options here. Um, one is that uh, it gets demolished, and eventually, if Town Hall needs to be expanded, uh, Town Hall gets expanded this way, and it ends up being a parking lot. Um, uh, the Morris Fire Company has uh, uh, addressed the possibility, if there's ever a desire to do an ambulance service, if an ambulance service is separated for some reason, and they're independent organizations, um, then it, that's an opportunity for it as well. Yeah, I think we both agree on the possible future uses of that property. It's the only property adjacent to this town hall that we could actually obtain. And other than the church, which I don't think, I hope we will ever go out of business. Uh, I'm not even sure. Are you in support of the 490 Act? Will someone please explain what it is? I don't know. Please for someone's lawyer. Huh? Okay. 490 Act, that's a, it's a, a way of uh, putting farmland and helping, kind of helping preserve farmland. It, the taxes <coughs> assess the farmland at a lower rate. Uh, it allows these farmers who, many of them don't make a lot of money off their property, but it allows them to hold on to that property, large amounts of property, at a lower tax rate. And it saves them on their expenses. Um, yeah, if I'm not correct, I believe there's other mechanisms right now for um, uh, diminishing the taxes on farmers. Um, so I, I have no problem with supporting um, our farm community with reduced taxes. Do you both agree in what is a flaw in terms of uh, qualifying for these special taxes? How do you define what a flaw is? I know that in Goshen, years ago they were 20, now it's about 5. Depends what type of farm you're talking about. Uh, there are produce farms, uh, there are beef farms, dairy, I mean, you name it. Some have uh, just poultry. It depends on what the assessor determines what a farm is, and whether or not they're eligible to receive the 490 exemption or tax rate. It's up to the assessor to determine based on local or state law? Local. Uh, yeah, so our. Uh, our planning and zoning regulations um, have some details about what is a farm um, and what what's a, um, what qualifies as a farm and what does not. So um, clearly, it, that's a conversation for um, for a, a, it would be our ordinance committee uh, if we're to be evolving our taxes. So it's a conversation to be had. Uh, there are several questions about how you, as first selectman would help to unify this town and provide more transparency on the way the government and its operations are. And how would you do that? So, yeah. um, so one of the first things I would do um, is uh, there's been there's been issues with 
our board of selectmen meetings, um, there's been concerns that the public doesn't feel like they have a voice. Um, in the last 21 months, only 35% of our board of selectmen meetings have um, allowed for public comment. Um, we can go back through the minutes and the agendas. Um, what I would like to do is I would like to record all of our board of selectmen meetings and town meetings like uh, tonight's debate is and post them on YouTube within a day of the meeting. It costs our town nothing. Um, it gets more people involved and interested in um, what's going on in their town, um, whether it's the, the nurse who's working that shift um, or it's the person who came home from work who simply wants to have dinner with their family. Um, this is an opportunity for us to be upfront and um, on display for all residents. Um, yeah. Well, I think uh, we're, we're moving in a good direction uh, with our new website. It is, uh, it's totally different from what we had before. It's much more user friendly. We can load many more documents and services on there. In fact, we already started with the uh, permit system for building permits. That is on the website. You just click a button, you fill out your permit, you can send it to the building inspector. That's just one of the features. We need to uh, probably, uh, as, he, as he's talking about video meetings, we've done that in the past. It was a little tough to get it done. So with this new website, you'll be able to go to the border commission that you want to read about or look at. And the agenda bu button will be there. You can view the agenda. The minutes button will be there. You can look at the minutes of that meeting. And the video button will be there, where you can see the video of that meeting if it was recorded. Moving forward, I think we should record as many meetings as we can, post them on the website. That way our snowbirds, when they're down in Florida, they can click onto the computer, see what's happening in Morris, keep them informed. And that's one step that we can make that happen. Um, so uh, there have been videos that were recorded of board select the meetings, and then it stopped. So I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, I personally don't think it's difficult. Um, it's simply the technology is there. There's a camera right there, um, and you press publish onto YouTube, and uh, or you post it on the website, and you walk away from the computer for ten minutes, and it's there. Um, I also don't, as a resident, I, I don't understand um, why two thirds of our board of select meetings in the past 21 months have not allowed for public comment. Well, when you talk about public comment, it is just that and you need to be very careful because of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, when the public comes to speak at a meeting, it is for them to comment. It's not for conversation because then you could get into a violation with the Freedom of Information Act. You don't want that to happen. I disagree with his, you know, 35% figure. I think that's wrong. All of our regular meetings, we add public comment if it's not already on the agenda. Special meetings, we've been told to be a bit leery about public comment because of the nature of a special meeting. We've been adding it for uh, agenda items only at special meetings, per the FOI Act, Free Freedom of Information Act. Um, in this past 21 months, we went seven calendar months without a Board of Selectmen meeting uh, allowing for public comment. So. Um, I do believe that the process that's been occurring is regular meetings have been scheduled and then canceled and rescheduled as special meetings, which then have not allowed for public comment or public comment on non-agenda items. That would be agenda items only because we don't want to violate the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, yes, there's been instances here where our schedules don't always work together. We have three people that have to be at that meeting. And we try to work with each of the selectmen to be there, where I would say, or Vinny, we'll give Vinny a call. Can you make this meeting at 4.30? No, I can't. Okay, how about 6? I can be there. That's how we do it. We work together. Well, thank you guys. Tonight is very good of you to appear and to give your opinions on the, uh, the problems and aspirations of ours. And now for the last two minutes, uh, we'd like to see you summarize what you think you can do for this town over the next period of your performance. Uh, I believe we begin with Kevin. Is this the closing statement or just yes. the uh, closing statement? Yeah. Well, first I want to thank uh, Carrie Mayers and Bernie Harrington and everyone from the Litchfield uh, uh, League of Women Voters for putting this on for us. This has been really cool um, as a resident. 
I hope that everyone had an opportunity to hear more information about us. Um, thank you for allowing me to share my vision of lower taxes, more transparency, and cooperative governing. Um, I look forward to taking the initiatives that I've shared with you. They're on my website, curlyformorris.com. I've shared with them door to door, and I talked about them some tonight, and putting them together in a solid, clear action plan. Um, there's no gimmicks, there's no vagueness. Um, and once again, there's a balance and a cooperative way to coming to agreements on a number of these issues. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank everyone for coming out tonight to be part of this debate. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for moderating and to Kevin Curley for accepting our offer to debate tonight. Thank you to my friend and running mate, Erica, for, offer, for agreeing to go for another term and working together and working so hard as a member of the Board of Selectmen. We make a great team. Thank you to my wife, Lisa, and my three daughters for allowing me to put the time into this campaign and into this job 24-7. Please come out and vote November 5th for myself, Erica, and the entire Row B. Vote for us, a vote for us is for proven leadership, fiscal responsibility, protecting our natural resources, and providing a good quality and affordable education for our children. Thank you very much. Anybody's not registered, we have floats in the back of the building.